Next up, we have Senfile 119, Center Eyed. Come on down. Defend the guard, too. Go ahead, and your floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, uh, introduce myself. I know all of you. I'm Bob Ide from Senate District 29, just newly elected. Um, thank you for having me here today. Appreciate the opportunity. Senate File 119 uh, is pretty straightforward. I won't kind of thumb through the whole bill. I want to just kind of go with a statement, but in a nutshell, Senate File 119 is, is just prohibiting the release of Wyoming National Guard without declaration of war from Congress. So um, I've got some things I want to talk about here, and I think we'll have some people online that know a lot more about this than I do, and maybe some people here just full disclosure, I've, I don't have any military service. Um, my family, my dad was in Korea and got a lot of friends and that have served. So uh, I've got a uh, sort of a closeness to this bill just from stories I've heard. And um, with that, I'll, I'll just get into my, my speech here, so to speak. Um, I believe the National Guard is the most professional fighting force in the world, made up of the bravest and most patriotic Americans. I believe that the National Guard can and should fight Americans' battles and defend our nation and our citizens. I believe that our elected representatives should have the same fidelity to the Constitution that our men and women in uniform do. Both have sworn the same oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. When the men and women in uniform rise to raise their right hand and swear this oath, it is more than just words to them. They are willing to die for this oath, every word of it. Elected representatives should have the same reverence. The US Constitution enumerates clearly defined and limited powers um, among them, and perhaps the most solemn, is the power to declare war, which rests solely upon Congress, who are the representatives of the people. The United States hasn't had a congressional declaration of war since June 3rd, 1942, when Roosevelt signed three congressional declarations of war against Bulgaria, Hungary, Romania, who had aligned with Germany in World War II. Since that time, the U.S. has engaged in over 28 wars without a declaration of war. Congress has abdic abdicated their responsibility for over 70 years and authorized the president to take our nation to war. We now use an undefined authorization of use of military force, which is nothing more than a congressional abdication that provides the president a blank check for any amount of money to go anywhere in the world that he sees fit. Could be a she eventually, for that matter. Um, for any length of time and against any enemy, ideology or tactic that he deems a threat to the United States. The militia clause in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15, authorizes the federalization of the National Guard for the following three purposes. Number one, to repel an invasion, number two, to put down an insurrection, and three, to enforce the laws of the union. A declaration of war by Congress, signed by the president, becomes the law of the union, thus granting the National Guard the authority to perform combat on foreign territory. Absent a declaration of war, the National Guard is limited in scope to their domestic home mission readiness and the threefold purposes of the U.S. Constitution. 
the Defend the Guard Act aligns the government, excuse me, the Defend the Guard Act aligns the governor's authority to protect Wyoming's National Guard and citizen soldiers from participating in undeclared wars with a purpose with a purpose and clear language of the US Constitution. Absent a congressional declaration of war, the governor, the governor shall withhold the National Guard troops in Wyoming from being released into federal service for the purposes of waging undeclared war. And finally, if there is some interest of the United States in a foreign land that is worthy of sending our uniformed men and women to go and defend it, then it is worth our elected leaders putting their name on it with a declaration of war and then provide the full backing and support of the United States of America to ensure that we fight and win with a clearly defined victory and then return home. Thank you. Okay, Senator, what, so you seem to want to make a decision between an authorization for use of military force and a declaration of war. Are you aware that in Congress votes on an authorization for use of military force, it's a law that goes through the process signed by the president if it's successful? Is that, is that sort of through the, the uh, 1973 War Powers Act? Yeah, is which it? was, yeah, so the, the answer is I, I think we're drawing an artificial distinction here between declaration of war and the actual law that's on the books approved by Congress over a presidential veto, by the way, right. which says that Congress will authorize the use of military force, grant the title statement. But I'm struggling to come up with an understanding of how it's materially different than Congress voting on declaration of war. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I, I believe you know a lot more about this than I do because you've had you've had experience and and I admire that and I and I thank you for that. Um, I think there might be some others testifying today that are, that uh, do have experience and can answer that a little better than I can. Um, you know, I'm I'm pretty simple. You know, the U.S. Constitution is is the supreme law of the land and and. Uh, I'm holding, you know, my my thoughts to that more than anything else as far as statute goes in, in Congress. Okay. Yeah. Any further questions for the front sponsor? No. Senator Gold. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Senator Dry. Uh, are you familiar with the Montgomery Amendment? I've read about it. I can't talk to you about that. I was some of this stuff that I've got here talks about the McGonnery Amendment. But no, I cannot answer you on that. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Any further questions? Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Okay. Oh, oh, oh Senator Furphy, go ahead. Let me ask you about um, the governor's authority. Um, if for some reason he was in conflict uh, with wanting to deploy the Wyoming National Guard, um, how does all that fit in your bill? Thank you. The, the bill itself essentially Without a declaration of war from Congress, the, the the governor doesn't really have the authority to send our troops to war. Or our National Guard, I, I should be specific, yeah. Um, let, let me follow up here. Other than a declaration of war, you're not saying um, the federal government can make use of our troops without the consent of the governor? Am I reading that? That would be correct, Senator Furphy. Mr. Chairman, Senator Furphy. Any further questions? Okay, thank you, Senator. Thank you. Looks like we have uh, Representative Andrew here, uh, so feel free to. Come on down, and Senator Hutchings.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Ocean Andrew, and I'm a representative from House District 46. I'm speaking in favor of Senate File 119, of which I'm the primary sponsor of its House Companion Bill. This is my second time sponsoring the Defend the Guard Act. I learned about this legislation from veterans who brought this issue to my attention and convinced me that Wyoming needs to be part of this movement. I took an oath of office to serve in this legislature. It is in part the same oath that, soldier, that a soldier takes when they join the military. The oath to uphold our constitution and its laws. But those oaths mean very different things in practice. Soldiers are the ones with skin in the game who are on the front lines fighting for the things that we talk about in this room. So when veterans come to me and say that they're tired of enduring six, seven, eight deployments, that they're tired of seeing no accountability on Capitol Hill, and that they're tired of being ignored by the people setting their policy, I listen. Polling has been consistent for the past four or five years, indicating that veterans are more likely to favor military withdrawals from our endless wars in the Middle East than civilians. More than two thirds of veterans favored the former president's initial plan to withdraw from Afghanistan, and the majority support leaving Iraq and Syria. I think we can all understand why they support a stop to this forever war. I'm 28 years old. My generation grew up in the shadow of the global war on terror, where casualty reports are just a regular part of the news cycle. It can be difficult to remember a time before the narrative of fighting a perpetual war for peace. Before we exited Afghanistan, there were multiple media write-ups about how American sons were now patrolling the same checkpoints and fighting in the same villages as their fathers. We had fought a 20-year war that had become multi-generational. I believe many of us don't appreciate the gravity of the situation and how endless war is not just on our national finances, but on our national soul. Senate File 119 would ensure that the Wyoming National Guard does not participate in open-ended and extra-legal conflicts like these. Okay, let, me, let me stop right there, Representative. There's an authorization for use of military force in Iraq and Afghanistan. You're, you're saying that those don't have any legal weight? Mr. Chairman, it's, I don't believe that that is the same thing as a declaration of I'll war. ask you again, and the same thing I had to sponsor, what's the material difference if Congress votes by overwhelming majorities? For authorization for use of military force, how is that different from a declaration of war? Mr. Chairman, I think it's substantively different to declare war on a country. I'm asking what than... that substance is. Do you have an answer? Mr. Chairman, I believe that declaring war is different than just saying we're going to send over military forces. I. It, it seems self-explanatory to me, but maybe not to you, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, it just seems that Congress votes on declaration of war, right? President signs the declaration. Congress votes on authorization for use of military force. President has to sign it before it goes into law. So what's the difference? You may disagree with the substance of mm -hmm. the declaration, and maybe I'd agree with you that it's a bad idea to have an open-ended one like the ones we have now. Mm -hmm. But to make the statement that somehow it's not as extra legal, I think is, I, I think you need to be a little bit more careful with the way you phrase it. Mr. Chairman, I, I would argue that there must be a reason we have to call it something different. Right, so, although there's a federal law that passed in 1973, I believe it's rooted in that, so. Anyways, continue. When our country is threatened and Congress has declared war, the cowboy state will be the first to answer the call. But until members of Congress show the same respect for our soldiers and perform their duty to debate and take a vote, our National Guard should not demean itself or their oath of office to the Constitution. Senate File 119 is a pro-veteran bill that puts the interests and safety of our soldiers first. And I encourage the committee to support it. Thank you. Any further questions? Hey, thank you, Representative. Senator Hutchings, do you have anything? Um, you know, I think, Mr. Chairman, 
I did. You have opened up my eyes to a lot of new laws. Um, members of the committee, thank you. Um, forgive me for not really being prepared. I was on my way home and I thought, you know what, I'm going to go back and give my two cents. Um, I'm looking at the uh, resolution for the um, uh, authorized use of military force, and I agree with you that if um, Congress does give the president that authority, it is, in essence, saying, hey, we're authorizing war. Um, but if we back up a little bit, I think what Senator I is trying to do in his bill is say this, no governor or no president can just arbitrarily do this. He has to get authorization from our um, Congress to do that. So that's what I feel needs to happen. And I think that's what the bill was trying to address that this constant we're at war, we're at war, we're at war without really declaring it or even Congress saying that we're at war um, is just not good. So that's my impression of the bill. I signed on to the one in um, the House without thinking about uh, the other acts. I served our country in the National Guard uh, as a technician, active duty, and 20 years in reserve with 42 and a half years of service that I'm proud of. But when I um, was out, there was a young lad that traveled around our, our state teaching the Constitution, which I love dearly. And one of the things he had was war in the Constitution. And it was there that I, I came to realize that that declaration is so important. And um, that's what I feel the bringer of the bill and those who support it are um, wanting for our guard members. I went all over the world and loved it, but I did it did so voluntarily. So I think that's what is going on. These um, young men want always for there to be a declaration of some kind and not just arbitrary power via our executive branch. So I'm on it for the, the bill and um, that's it. And thank you for the education. Okay, any questions for Senator Hutchins? Thank you. Thank you. I'll call me. <laughs> All right, next up we'll have the military department. Mr. Smith, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Chris Smith. I'm an attorney with the Wyoming Military Department. Uh, Major General Porter sends his regrets. He's in DC for a series of meetings he couldn't get out of, so you're stuck with me tonight. Um, Cinephile 119 is the third time this body since 2020 has looked at the Defend the Guard Act. Um, it was brought in 20 and also in 21. There are several issues with, with this kind of action. As a retired guard member, um, I, on a personal level, am against it because I think it ties the governor's hands. But I wanted to highlight a couple of legal issues and then some very practical issues uh, for the committee. On the legal side, as, as our chairman mentioned, um, every action in the last 22 years, really every action since Vietnam when the War Powers Act was passed, I think in 73, they created a methodology for Congress to authorize the use of military force. So unfettered ability to use military force by the president hasn't been true since 1973, in my opinion as an attorney. In 2001, after 9-11, which caused me to go back in the military uh, full time, Congress did pass the authorization to use military force. It was signed into law and uh, it became the law of the land. And it essentially still is the law of the land. And it authorized the president to conduct operations using military force throughout the world against all of the various terrorist organizations that were at, at risk as a country after 9-11. 
from a constitutional law point of view, there's some really interesting issues here. Uh, Article one, section eight reserves to the legis to Congress the ability to declare war. Some constitutional lawyers far smarter than me would say reserving to them the ability to declare war doesn't mean that's the only thing that can be done in terms of use of military force. It's just Congress is the one that has to declare war. Um, so that, that is one of the interesting issues about this bill. Another legal part I wanted to bring to the committee's attention in Title 32 of the United States Code, which is the portion of the United States Code, the body of law that the National Guard operates under, um, in Section 108, and I'll quote it in full, but it'd be good to put on my reading glass so I can actually read it. It says, if when a time fixed by the president, a state fails to comply with the requirement of this title or a regulation prescribed under this title, the National Guard of that state is barred in whole or in part as the president may prescribe from receiving money or any other aid, benefit, or privilege authorized by law. Title 32 is the way we, we mobilize for in the United States emergencies. Title 10 is the active duty statute. So Congress has already passed a law in 32 USC 108 that basically gives the president the right to take action against a state that doesn't meet the requirements of Title 32, which includes presidential call-ups and some other actions calling the guard into duty. Um, I didn't bring all the details because I didn't want to bore the committee with all the law. There is essentially nine authorizations, some people counted as seven, that the president can call the guard to duty. Um, two of those require governor consent. The other seven do not. There are various emergency authorizations. So I just wanted to bring that to the committee's attention. There is a lot of law out there on the books of the US code concerning how the guard is mobilized. All of you are no doubt familiar in it, and I'll just throw this out there. The Constitution is the living, breathing document that we all operate under, but it does not contain all of the laws of the land, right? Article 1, Section 8 simply says it's reserved to Congress to declare war. That's all it says, to declare war. It doesn't say if and when and what the conditions are. That's what the US code does to explain what the Constitution has been interpreted to mean over the last 200 years. So I'll just, there's a lot of laws that we all pay attention to in the federal government that are not in the Constitution, including the War Powers Act of 73. On a practical note, I, did, I wanted to bring the, to the committee's attention just some factual things about your guard. The Wyoming National Guard, all of their major weapon system and most of their equipment is owned by the federal government. Our latest inventory, approximately $880 million of equipment owned by the federal government is loaned to the Wyoming National Guard for training and use in operations. That's Black Hawk helicopters, HIMARS rocket systems, C-130 aircraft, and all the other thing, guns, all that stuff. That is all on loan by the federal government. At any given time, under 32 USC 108, the president can take it all away. The second thing the committee needs to understand is currently the Wyoming National Guard accounts for $35 million annually in federal salaries of National Guard members. That's 100% federally paid for, $35 million. At any given moment, if this state chooses to pass a law like the Defend the Guard Act, and the president realizes that no longer is Wyoming available to him in the DOD, they could withdraw all of that funding. About $110 million annually comes into the state from the federal government for, for the Wyoming National Guard. 35 million of that is salaries, just to, to run that number by you. Last year, according to my limited research, Wikipedia being a wonderful thing, 31 states considered the Defend the Guard Act last year in 2022. None of those states passed it. In my opinion, the reason for that is this is not the kind of thing you want to be the first state to pass. 
The fear I have is Wyoming is not the most populous state. We do not have, we have one of the, I think, bottom five size of guards in the 54 states and territories that have National Guards. We would be very easy to be made an example of if we were to pass an act like this and pull all of that equipment, all of that funding out because we really have some pretty limited federal power in the political scale. They probably wouldn't do that to Texas, California, Ohio, New York, but Wyoming is a concern if we were the first ones to pass an act like this. With that, I'll stand for the committee's questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Smith. Any questions, committee? Okay, thank you, appreciate it. So, looks like uh, we'll open up to public comment. Anybody in the room? Come on down. Then we'll get to uh, the folks online right after we get the in-room testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, first, I, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for hearing this piece of legislation. I know it's probably not your favorite piece of legislation, um, but uh, we've had many debates about this legislation, and I appreciate you giving the opportunity. I, I think it's an important opportunity. It's a great debate to have. Uh, because the reality is, members and chairman, Congress is not having this debate. Um, yeah, I think it is. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Senator. Uh, my name is Tyler Lindholm. I'm the state director for Americans uh, for Prosperity, and I, I am testifying in favor of this legislation. Brief, brief background, I served five years in the U.S. Navy. I joined May of 2001. Um, and got out in May of 2006. When I first joined, it was a very different world in the United States military, and it changed very quickly. <laughs> um, so, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I have this whole, um, uh, I've got my testimony all, all, all written out, and I've got some great quotes by our founding fathers, uh, which I would argue would, would declare legislative intent, something that all of you hold and, and hold dear, because it is, it is super important to have that legislative intent. And clearly, um, our founders in Philadelphia, when they put together the Constitution um, and they were um, putting that together, they clearly did a lot of things in our Constitution for a very specific purpose, right? Uh, the First Amendment they put in there, the freedom of speech, uh, specifically because uh, Britain kind of sucked at that. Um, and so they put that in there. The Second Amendment, they put in there the right to bear arms. The Third Amendment, and I actually I would challenge anybody in this room to cite the Third Amendment. Most people don't because it's not really relative nowadays. Um, but what it is, is no quartering of troops. So that the entire Bill of Rights was about that. But also Article 1, Section 8, it was about this monarchical power um, that existed at the time, right? Where only one person, King George III, had all the power to declare war and go to war. And so legislative intent, in fact, there's some really good quotes um, from George Washington, James Ma Madison. James Madison, the, the father of the U.S. Constitution, specifically cites that the power of war shall be with the legislature. Now, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I, I did hear the question, what is the material difference between an authorization of U.S. Uh, authorization of, of, of military force and um, a declaration of war? There is a material difference. It's a, it's a big material difference, and it has to do with international law, and it has to do with what happens when a declaration of war and what, what is triggered in statute at that time. So there is a very big material difference that is worth noting, um, and there is also a big difference between um, standing on the line and having the bravery to do the right thing, which Congress has lacked. They have since World War II, and I, I would argue that when you look at these authorizations for use of military force, none of them stand up to the last time we declared war as far as a benefit. We could look at Iraq currently. Is Saddam Hussein still in power? Weapons of mass destruction, anyone? Are, are any of those things happening? Because if the answer is no, then why do we still have 2,500 troops over there right now? What about the thousand troops in northern Syria? We don't have an authorization for use of military force even, even, even in place on that. And yet there they are. And some of those are guardsmen out of Ohio. And so, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, when it comes down to this piece of legislation, certainly um, the military staff that just testified is absolutely correct. 
they're going to threaten money and they're going and they did that the first time this bill was run in, in 2020 mr chairman um i i believe you uh, wrote an op-ed um castigating me on that and it you know and that that's all good and fun in politics and me and you go way back so no harm no foul um but mr chairman members of the committee when that bill was first introduced what did the pentagon do they immediately called the speaker of the house via our representative at the time and um, our, our federal representative and cited that the C-130s are gonna disappear. That's the hook, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. How much are you willing to trade Wyoming lives for money? A declaration of war is an important part of our US constitution and there is a material difference. And by the way, the Montgomery Amendment, I do know about Senator Kolb um, and it's an interesting piece of law, but we're not the first ones to think of this. This happened in the eighties when, um, we were still a little tired of what happened after Vietnam, and there was some governors that I would argue, Maine and Ohio, were brave enough to stand up for their National Guard and say no. And what happened? The Pentagon threatened money and resources. And that's a really tough thing to take under consideration, considering because um, the gentleman that spoke before me is absolutely right. It is tough. But Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, you were not elected to do the easy thing. You were elected to do the hard thing. And so as a veteran myself, I, I stand in favor of the legislation and I'll stand for any of your questions. Any questions, committee? Okay, you mentioned the founding fathers. Um, so John Adams, important part of the, I mean, maybe wasn't there for the Constitutional Convention, but but also George Washington. I mean, all those guys were commanders in chief at the early you know, beginning of our republic. So, I mean, was there a declaration of war for the, Putting down the whiskey rebellion or the quasi war seems like you know if, if that is if it's true what you said it is and you know and your interpretation mm -hmm. is theirs why do they not act like they shared your interpretation mr chairman i i actually love that question because i i think that was i think the dream of the republic definitely faltered under the whiskey rebellion and and thank you for bringing up the whiskey whiskey rebellion not many people know about it uh but the, the short end of that is george washington and hamilton I, I don't think anybody wants to look back fondly at, at, at Hamilton as being um, solid advice. He started the first central bank, so I have to be anti-Hamilton. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, they definitely faltered, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, that isn't, they're men, they're, they're fallible. Um, but it was George Washington that said, the Constitution vests the power of declaring war in Congress. Therefore, no offensive expedition of importance can be undertaken until after they shall have deliberated upon the subject and authorize such a measure. That was George Washington. James Madison goes even farther in saying the executive has no right in any case to decide the question whether there is or is not cause for declaring war. Okay. What was James Madison in Congress during the quasi war where we went to war with France for, with no authorization, no declaration of war at all? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, men are fallible. I, I, I don't think we should look at the sins of our um, or the, the skip ups of, of, of the past as an excuse to continue to ignore the Constitution. Okay. Any further questions? Senator Cole. If I dare. Uh, good day, former Representative Lindholm. Uh, is it true that, I guess, as a Wyoming state uh, senator or representative, you swore an oath that to the Wyoming state Constitution? that the supreme law of the land is in fact the United States Constitution. Do you agree with that? Mr. Chairman, yes, I do, Senator Culp. Okay, I, I would contend that your beef is in the wrong venue. This is a federal issue. The courts have ruled in Montgomery that you that was incorrect. They ruled against the governors and their with, withholding of said troops because they in fact hold a dual enlistment. And when called up, they are part of the uh, the, the guards called into active service, and they, in fact, become not a National Guardsman anymore, but, in fact, in, in, in uh, active service. And that's a fact. It's been decided in the courts. This is not about just, I mean, I don't want to be rhetorical, but these are facts set out in law. And irregardless of any other argument you may mount, how do you defend the fact that, the, that this law has been settled that in fact the governor cannot, repeat, cannot withhold, I don't care about the money, I care less about that, I care about people. The governor can't withhold said 
National Guard folks. And, and I read the court opinions, as many of the a history of this for a long time. So how do you square that? How do you square you, I guess, wishing to override that case law with saying that somehow uh, people should care about the troops, which I deeply do. And I really, I don't like the fact that anyone would insinuate I wouldn't or don't. I care about law though also, and I swore an oath. So tell me how all this works, how we can get around it without any, you know, straight on answer. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, please. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And to, to Senator Kolb, um, I, I'm definitely not going to insinuate that you that anyone on this committee doesn't care about the troops. I'm a veteran myself, and I, I see uh, the care that comes about from uh, fellow Wyomingites every day. Wyoming's got a long, strong history, as does my family, as, as does probably your family, um, of supporting our troops. My concern, Mr. Chairman, is that first of all, I, I do believe, um, while I think there's a similarity between the Montgomery um, situation and what shook out between Ohio and Maine, I do think that this is materially different uh, because it is a state just declaring for the facts that our National Guard will not deploy unless Congress declares war. Um, so that's, that's somewhat different than what shook out in the Montgomery situation. Um, and how I, how I settle that with myself, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the committee, is it's law. This is what you're doing, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. And if it, if it doesn't work, at least you tried. I, th I think it's a great, I, I think it's a great endeavor to undertake. Okay. Any further questions for Mr. Lindholm? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, we'll move online. It looks like we have about four people last we checked. Uh, so we'll go ahead and let's see if Mr. McKnight is available. I'm admitting Mr. McKnight. Okay. Yeah, go, go ahead and admit I, all of them if that's okay. We'll just go from there. Yeah. All right, Mr. McKnight, we can see you. Uh, go ahead and proceed with your testimony. Excellent, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for your time. I know it's late, and so I'll, I'll attempt to be brief, as brief as I can. Uh, my name is Dan McKnight. I'm a 13-year veteran of the military. I served in the Marine Corps, in the active duty Army, and in the Idaho Army National Guard. I deployed to Afghanistan in 2005, 2006, and 2007. Uh, where I was injured and I came home and, uh, and retired after 13 years. Um, I'm also the chairman of a veterans organization nationwide, um, and it's called Bring Our Troops Home. And our membership includes veterans from every war conflict, um, from World War II through the endless wars that our nation is currently fighting in over 25 nations. But the overwhelming majority of our members are veterans of the global war on terror with multiple combat tours. Uh, Bring Our Troops Home, our organization and myself, we're here in support of uh, SF-119, commonly referred to as Defend the Guard. Uh, before I get into my testimony, I do want to address a couple of questions that have been asked, and I think I can offer some light on that. Uh, one was when Mr. Smith uh, did very articulately talk about defunding of the National Guard, he was in, speaking in reference to Title 32. You see, there are two ways that the National Guard can be called into federal service, Title 10 and Title 32. This bill specifically deals with Title 10 and Title 10 only, and nothing in the bill would limit or prohibit a Title 32 call-up. And so the penalties and the defunding of the National Guard in Title 32 uh, has nothing to do with the Defend the Guard legislation. Um, I, I wanna address Senator Furphy, I believe, um, when he asked questions about uh, the governor withholding the troops. The Defend the Guard bill, again, is a Title 10 only bill and only combat deployments undeclared by Congress would be affected by this bill. Any other constitutionally permitted call up of the Wyoming National Guard for federal service, that could be defense, that could be national emergency, that could be civil unrest, repelling an invasion, putting down an insurrection, or enforcing the laws of the, of the land would not be affected at all. It's simply combat tours. Uh, and with that, we, the one last thing I wanna address before my testimony is the funding issue. You see, there is a fiscal note attached to this bill. Uh, the military department indicated that passage of 119 may jeopardize federal funding of the Wyoming National Guard. 
This fiscal note acknowledges that nothing inherent in the bill will affect the state budget beyond uh, a potential light increase in administrative staffing. And we acknowledge 96% of the Wyoming National Guard resources do come from the federal government. And critics of Senate File 119 claim uh, that the Guard does not participate in unconstitutional combat deployments. The federal government will defund the state National Guard, but that simply isn't a reality. Beyond the obvious moral quandary of exchanging lives, uh, safety, and legal protections of our National Guardsmen in exchange for money taken from our own taxpayers to start with, I'd like to address the impossibility of this fear-mongering with a very recent and very relevant example. This is not the first time, nor the first state, that Defend the Guard Act has been introduced. Kansas, for example, we have a fiscal note from the Adjutant General's office that states that uh, enactment to defend the guard would have no fiscal effect on the state. In Wyoming, during previous sessions when the bill was brought before the legislature, it found its biggest opponent, not in the state legislature, but at the federal level with then representative Liz Cheney. Members of the Wyoming legislature reported to our organization, to the sponsors, that representative Cheney had directed threats that this would, if this bill passed that the Wyoming guardsmen were prevented from fighting in endless wars like Afghanistan or Iraq or Syria, she would personally ensure that the Wyoming National Guard was defunded, bases would be closed, jobs would be lost, and equipment would be seized. She was willing to inflict punitive damages on her constituents, leaving them resourceless and endangered if they attempted to enforce the prerequisite legal constraints of the United States Constitution. We witnessed last August the obvious backlash of, of those type of spiteful attitudes. In my opinion, Representative Liz Cheney is a special case of a politician who would place the demands of the deep state ahead of the rights, the legal rights. That's right. Uh, just let me, could you please focus on the bill before us? Certainly, so you, certainly. you spent a lot of time talking about stuff that happened two years ago. Right. Just for yep, record, absolutely. I, was, I was very opposed to it, and, and Ms. Cheney did not contact me at all. So uh, just, let's let's try to focus. It's late night, like you, as you noted at the beginning yep. of this morning. Let's focus on the bill and, and the present, if you would. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the National Defense Act of 1916 brought the state militia under more federal control, um, more federal funding, and gave the president the authority in case of war and national emergency to mobilize the National Guard. And since that time, the terms militia and National Guard have been used interchangeably, whether historically accurate or not. The National Guard is part of the militia, but it is not the entirety of the militia. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15, we've all heard. Um, the militia clause states that the militia and therefore the National Guard may be called forth into federal service to repel an invasion, to put down an insurrection, and to enforce the laws of the Union. And that last part, the law of the Union, is what we're here to talk about today. So um, the National Guard, for me, like we talked about beginning, can be called up two different ways, Title 32 and Title 10. There's three actual ways. One is state call up, and that is a state-funded mission where they're called into active duty to serve the state. It's funded by the state, it's controlled by the state. Title 32 brings the National Guard into federal um, call up for domestic, civil defense, national emergency. It's state controlled, but it's federally funded. Some examples of this would be the Wyoming National Guard during COVID relief or the California Guard during wildfires. Title 10, this is the important part, is primarily used to call the National Guard to participate in armed conflicts, war, humanitarian relief, or training outside of the United States. Activating the National Guard into federal service to fight a war declared by Congress is proper, it's legal, and it's one of the intended purposes of the National Guard. Training overseas is a proper Title X activation. Assisting in humanitarian missions is a proper Title X activation. Participating in an armed conflict or participating as an instrumentality of war or performing hazardous service relating to an armed conflict in a foreign state without an Article I declaration of war by Congress, it's not proper. It's not the proper use of the National Guard. However, a congressional declaration of war changes everything. It changes the state of our nation from a state of peace into a state of war. And that's the specific difference about the AUMF that somebody asked, and I believe it was you, Mr. Chairman, what the difference between a declaration of war and an AUMF is. You see, an authorization of use of military force concedes final decision-making authority to the president. When these AUMFs are passed, a state of war does not exist until the president, him or herself, decides to act. The AUMF 
through AUMFs, Congress does not have a vote to go to war, but it votes to allow the president to make his or her own decision. It concedes their authority that we have given to them. We, the people, have given to Congress. They give away that authority. And an act of Congress cannot supersede the Constitution. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land. That kind of action would require a constitutional amendment. And an AUMF is the legal equivalent of the president issuing a binding judicial op opinion or the Supreme Court uh, voting for to raise taxes. It's the same thing. Um, after Congress passed the 2002 AUMF in October, the Iraq war did not begin until March of 2003. Hypothetically, but not realistically, President George W. Bush could have decided not to go to war following Congress's vote, giving him the permission to do so. Mr. McKnight, uh, if you could, we have other people who want to testify, and it has been a long day for us. If you could please uh, find a conclusion, that would be. Certainly, I'll find a conclusion right now, Mr. Okay. Chairman. I apologize. Oh, yeah. Okay, no worries. I appreciate your service. I appreciate your passion. And, uh, uh, but well, like I said, it, uh, yeah, we, we are uh, uh, approaching eight o'clock here. So, any questions for Mr. McKnight? Okay, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Okay, let's see. We have a Mr. Williamson from Riverton. Uh, please, we'll, we'll go ahead and ask any further testimony to limit their um, testimony to about two minutes. So, if Mr. Williamson, are, are you are you there? Do I have Brandon Williamson from Riverton? Yes, sir. Sorry, I was muted and had to figure out how to unmute it. No, how you feel? Okay, please proceed. Like I said, we're trying to keep it to about two minutes moving forward. All right. I'll just hit the high points for y'all then. So my name is Brandon Williamson. I'm testifying in favor of a Senate Bill 119 on behalf of myself. Um, I serve as an 11 Bravo infantryman in the United States Army. Like all soldiers when I enlisted, I took an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution. Same one all of y'all took. As a veteran, I take that oath very seriously. I pledge to my family, friends, and countrymen that if circumstances demanded, I would willingly lay down my life for this nation and its laws and the freedom of its people. So it kind of just offends me on when Congress doesn't go through the proper channels and the constitutionally prescribed channels to declare war. Uh, and I don't think that's something that we can allow them to ignore out of convenience. Uh, it's in our best interest to our soldiers and to the people of this country to hold Congress accountable by forcing them to make the declaration of war. So, you know, one second, there's a part down here. Um, there's a huge human impact uh, that these wars have had. Um, and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and the other smaller ones that were all encompassed under the GWAT, we had more than 7,000 of our finest men and women in the past 20 years that were killed in action fighting in these unconstitutional wars overseas. Um, that's 7,000 families who will never see their brothers, fathers, husbands, mothers, daughters, or wives again. These undeclared wars don't on, end on the battlefield either. According to the Department of Veterans Affairs, at least 20% of the veterans of the global war on, on terror, a conservative estimate, suffer the mental and emotional effects of combat for as many as 18 months per deployment. I've personally seen the long-lasting effects of post-traumatic stress disorder and many of my closest friends who've been in some of the most intense fighting of the GWAD. Now, this trauma, it often leads to suicide. The Cost of War Project at Brown University has concluded that over 31,000 service members and veterans have killed themselves since 9-11. It's four times as many as we've lost in combat. And each of these soldiers died as a consequence of these wars that the representatives declined to vote on. So, you know, this the passage of this bill could rectify that. Nearly half of the, the armed forces in the GWAT were National Guardsmen. And unfortunately, they've accounted for 18% of the casualties that I listed. The, um, the Wyoming legislator has the opportunity right now to tell the federal government that it can't use our National Guards to fight un undeclared illegal wars. You know, this isn't going to affect, like Mr. McKnight said, it's not going to affect training or um, humanitarian release, relief operations. It's only going to impact being sent to combat to fight and die in these wars that Congress never approved that they abdicated that power to the president. And so I would just like to urge all the members of the committee to please support this bill. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Williamson. Um, uh, thank you for your service, appreciate it, and appreciate you sticking with us with your testimony. Any questions? Okay, thank you, sir. Next up, we have a Thomas uh, Rollman, perhaps. Forgive me if I mispronounced mm -hmm. that name. But if you're still here, Thomas, uh, feel free to. Mm -hmm. 
I'm sorry, he didn't have his hand up. He's not in yet, but okay. um, I've uh, admitted Bill Talon okay. and Dale Steenberg. Okay, Bill Talon, you'll be next, and then if we can get Mr. Roman in the room. Uh, let's go ahead, Mr. Talon. Yes, sir. Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Um, I've been a Wyoming resident since 2012. I served in the U.S. Army 1973 to 75 in the Army National Guard 77 to 80. Uh, I retired as a federal agent and director of operations for the National Nuclear Security Administration, uh, transporting nuclear weapons and material. I attended the U.S. War Co Naval War College and uh, earned a master's degree in national security and strategic studies in 2007. Uh, I support Senate File 119 for the following reasons, and forgive me if I'm a little bit redundant. Uh, a lot of these points have been made, and I'll try to be brief. The U.S. Constitution assigned to Congress the exclusive power to declare war, but every American combat action since World War II has been conducted without a declaration of war. And throughout our history, there have been some military actions taken without a declaration of war, but until the last 70 years, these were usually short, sharp, and limited in scope. There have been great abuses, such as the Vietnam War, 20 years, 350,000 U.S. combat casualties, and no congressional authorization. Alarmed over the, that abuse of constitutional power, Congress indeed passed the War Powers Act in 1973. With very narrow exceptions, it limits military combat operations to a maximum of 90 days without a specific congressional authorization for the use of military force or a declaration of war. That War Powers Resolution is the law of the land, but most presidents since its passage have ignored or violated the intent of the War Powers Resolution and they have not been held to account by Congress or the courts. And we should recognize that the US public usually supports military operations of limited scope, even with heavy casualties and, and high costs, when they have clearly stated objectives, are resolved quickly and are successful. However, the forces capable of acting within that 90 day window established by the War Powers Resolution are overwhelmingly active duty US military forces. Army Guard units are unlikely to be deployable into combat within that 90 day window. We have seen recently continuous rotational deployment of the National Guard into overseas combat roles for most of the last 20 years from the beginning of the global war on terror in 2001. The impact on our Guard members, their families, and our economy has been enormous, and recruiting and retention have suffered greatly. And all of that without either a congressional declaration of war or even proper authorization under the War Powers Resolution, the intent of which was to limit the duration of combat that United States troops, including the National Guard, could be committed to without a declaration of war. I totally believe that the Wyoming National Guard should stand ready to support the national defense, but only within the bounds of the U.S. Constitution and U.S. law, and this bill will ensure that those boundaries will be observed. So I thank you very much. Um, stand for questions if you wish. Hey, thank you, Mr. Town. Any questions? Hey, thank you for your testimony. I appreciate it. Uh, do we have Mr. Roman available? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I admitted Thomas Ruhlman. Hey, yes, I'm on. Can you... We can hear you. Go ahead. All right. Good evening. That's something on there. And if you have the YouTube feed, you might want to turn that off. Maybe that's providing some feedback there. Uh, okay. Stand by. That seems to be better. You want to go ahead and proceed? Is that working? Yeah, got you. Got you. Hi, my name is Tom Rollman, uh, and I live in Cody, Wyoming. I'm a former Navy light attack pilot and graduate of Top Gun. I served in the Navy from 1978 to 1988 with two deployments on the USS Enterprise and one tour as an adversary pilot. The Defend the Guard Act is a step in the right direction. For our elected officials to take office, they must swear to support and defend our nation's constitution. They may say the words, but especially today, our elected officials in Washington knowingly violate our Constitution. As our history shows, our elected officials in Washington have not only disregarded their constitutional responsibility to declare war when deploying our soldiers into combat, but have also disregarded many other elements of our Constitution as well. Our soldiers take the same oath to support and defend our Constitution and, whether peacetime or at war, knowingly risk their lives to defend this document. 
The history and freedom of our nation has depended on the unselfish courage of these soldiers, men and women who have integrity and will actually stand up and fight for what they believe in, our country and its constitution. They truly do support and defend our constitution every day because contrary to our elected officials, soldiers can be punished for failing to abide by their oath. For our elected officials in Washington, there is no accountability or punishment in place for their failure to abide by the oath that they took for their office. Because there is no accountability or punishment, our elected officials, especially today, have no fear in violating that oath of office. It is time for this nonsense to end. Our nation is at a crossroads of losing the very freedoms provided by our constitution that our elected officials swore to uphold. Wyoming, with its old school patriotism and belief in conservative principles of government, has the unique opportunity to lead our country and implement real change. This bill is the beginning of that leadership and will help our nation get back on its constitutional track. So while I fully and strongly support this bill as a step in the right direction, I am an even stronger advocate for a bill that implements full accountability and punishment of any elected official that is identified by their peers for a failure to follow their oath of office, our constitution, or US law. A single incident would result in immediate removal from office and would prohibit that elected official from holding any future public office. Tough? You bet. But violating an oath of office, our constitution or US law is serious. Our troops know it, so should our elected officials. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I appreciate you for allowing me to speak. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Mr. Roman. Any questions? Hey, thank you, sir. Looks like we have Dale uh, Steenberg. Uh, if you're also online. Uh, feel free to proceed. Like I said, we're trying to keep this testimony about two minutes, if you could, sir. I've already clicked my uh, timer, Mr. Chairman, so I, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm sorry for my appearance. I wish I could be there, but on a, such a balmy day, I needed to feed the cows. So and that's what I've been doing this evening. I would like to weigh in, though. I love the Wyoming National Garden. We've been talking a lot about the sword aspect of this, but I wonder about the shield aspect of this. We all welcome uh, the guard into our communities, flying C-130s whenever it snows too much and they're feeding our cows or rescuing us when we uh, go pull a stunt and get stranded on a mountain or, uh, you know, using their equipment to stop a flooding of our communities. None of that equipment would be here um, if we pass this bill. And you don't have to be a, I'm, I'm certainly not a constitutional attorney and I can't um, somehow tell you exactly what our founding fathers would say, but I can tell you this, that if I can't use equipment, why would I keep it there? I'm going to move it. And that's exactly what would happen to us. They're not going to leave C-130s and helicopters and Humvees in a, in a state um, that questions the authority of the federal government uh, to use this. You know, as far as the the uh, abuse of powers and going to war, our forefathers, uh, we, one of the longest wars we ever fought was with the Barbary pirates. Thomas Jefferson asked Congress to declare war, and they didn't, so he sent uh, ships to the Mediterranean to protect Americans. That's what we do. Mr. Chairman, I just ask that you defend our National Guard, defend our sword and shield, and we all know that the law is well established on this. I get it. Everybody's ticked at Congress. Well, go go help people get elected to Congress that um, see your same views. But don't take our guard down and don't hurt our Wyoming guard as you do it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, thank you, sir. Any questions? The Cheyenne Chamber of Commerce. Hey, thank you, sir. Okay, that's all the uh, testimony that we had ahead of, uh, we knew about ahead of time. Any any further, anybody else online? Just double check. There's, there's one more gentleman, Jeremy Royer. Okay, uh, Jeremy, welcome to Senate Transportation. Uh, the floor is yours. Like I said, we ask that you leave, leave it at about two minutes if you can. Hello, sir. How are you? Thank you for having me today. Uh, my name is Jeremy Royer. I'm from Cheyenne, Wyoming. I'm a rock and roll musician and a blue collar worker that's never had a government job, which is different from a lot of the folks that we've had testify. 
Mr. McKnight and Mr. Lindholm and, and so many of the other speakers have done such a good job explaining how this bill is purely a constitutional bill that is intended to defend our guard and to keep the Constitution in good order. Uh, I, I really think that you should pay special attention, especially, especially to Mr. McKnight's uh, testimony. The thing is, is that what we do have coming from the other side is, hey, we're going to take away your money. And even our friend from the Chamber of Commerce, who has never found uh, a bit of federal cash that he doesn't want to cash into, especially if it's really going back to Raytheon and General Dynamics, that's what Dale Steenburgen has been great at. And the Chamber has been great at. Well, Sir, here's the thing. That is... Roy, excuse me, could you just try to focus on the bill, please, and try to, uh, or try to avoid uh, you know, being too personal? The bill, the bill, sir, is a big circle that goes back to Bell Helicopter and General Dynamics and Raytheon. And let me tell you something. None of those companies keep their money in our banks. None of those companies are building their material in our state. This is swamp money, and it's going straight back to the swamp. So the, the thing about this bill is, is are they going to threaten us our money? Yes. Can they really do it? No. As Mr. Uh, uh, earlier mentioned, we're, we're still within the grounds of Title 10 and Title 32 on this. This is what we have to do to protect our people. And it's the bare minimum that we should be asking for our federal government to provide to our National Guard, unless all the Republicans in this state are ready to change their campaign to, well, the Constitution means a lot to us unless we can get an airport out of it. And I don't think you are. I don't think you'd be elected if you were. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, Mr. Royer. Any questions? Okay, thank you for your testimony. It looks like we have exhausted the online testimony and the in-person testimony, so public comment is closed. Committee, what's your pleasure? Uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, I, I would actually like to move this bill so that I can speak against it. So I move the bill. And, and frankly, as a, as a former commander of the Wyoming Air Guard, uh, I see actually this kind of action offensive to my guardsmen and to the troops that served under me. Everybody that, that, um, joined the guard certainly since i've joined it back in the 80s understood the commitment is a volunteer force um they knew exactly what they were getting into and if if and i've i've spent plenty of time uh, back in dc uh, looking at resourcing our our guard uh, and i know full well 90 percent of the testimony we heard tonight is um, is not is not uh, 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 accurate and correct, uh, um, and it plays on a lot of fear. And I believe that that uh, we should resist this. And there's a reason why all the other states haven't passed it. It's bad policy, and and frankly, um, those people who don't think that the federal government yank our our uh, our assets. Uh, they're mistaken. I've been there. I know. And I've struggled for our missions and trying to keep our missions. I mean, even without the threat of, of not sending troops, we have a hard time justifying our missions. And I have a lot of guardsmen that are friends that, that are, are, um, um, enjoy what they do. They know the, the issue, um, and they know the ops tempo. We've had this ops tempo since 911. And uh, certainly anybody that doesn't agree with it doesn't have to join the guard. Doesn't have to put their hand up. But they do that out of out of uh, out of commitment to their country. They do get certain benefits. Uh, there's a lot of reasons people join the guard. But they know what they're getting into when they get into it. And, and for someone to tell me that uh, we're, we're uh, violating the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, when clearly all that does is authorizes 
um, a declaration of war. Doesn't say that's the only way. And we have passed laws, as as a good uh, counselor from the guard uh, has has uh, so aptly uh, uh, provided us uh, uh, the the uh, the different ways that we can we can actually go into armed conflict. And uh, uh, I, I just be, I just believe this is a bad law, and and uh, I wanted to move it so I could vote against it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I guess I, I did thank you for moving the bill because I did want to comment also. Um, I just, I find it amazing. People are wound up about the federal government, which I agree. I think they're out of control doing what the heck ever they want to do, and they make some bad choices. I, I'm not here to defend them and Norm. I, uh, you know, a U.S. Senator or House member. I am, a, in fact, a state of the Wyoming Senator who swore an oath to the state of Wyoming. And that oath was very clear because it was brought up about the oath. It, I'd be in violation of my oath if I was to agree to this bill. Uh, frankly, this bill is unconstitutional as written, proven by the courts. Uh, Everyone's beef is with the federal government about what they did and how they did it. And I, I agree. I mean, I, they've done a lot of things that I don't agree with. But to come to the state of Wyoming to try to have uh, this resolved here is just, frankly, uh, not working. Uh, it's circle talk for, for what people know of this. And uh, I, I just want to talk plainly about this. I will not stand here and be in my reputation impugned by somebody saying that I don't care about the National Guard, our military, or anything else because I don't listen to their argument. I do listen to their argument, but it's irrational. It's emotional, and, and it's not to say I, just, I don't disagree with them. I just think it is the wrong way to handle this. This is, frankly, I'm just kind of frustrated that people just run off the handle and talk about things that are irrelevant. I, is, I support military, my sons, my, my family. So please, I will not stand by and have anything tarnished by, by what I do and why I do it. And uh, I just want people to know that. So thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Chairman, to comment. I'm sorry I was long-winded. Any further comments? Okay, well, I'll, I'll close it out here then. Uh, so on and against the bill, obviously. I appreciate the folks who feel passionate about it. And, uh, um, you know, it certainly, uh, hopefully it's been a good discussion, but I, I just have a problem with the narrative. I think it's fundamentally false that you have to declare war to uh, send our military forces in harm's way. Go back to the beginning of our country, you'll find that that is absolutely not true. And so I have a problem with what seems to be a, an attempt to take advantage of a relative amount of ignorance among state legislators. Obviously, this is something we deal with. Um, on a daily basis. Um, it seems like this whole movement is an attempt to take advantage of, a, of the fact that we don't, there may be a legislative committee out there that, that falls for the rhetoric that we heard. So I just, you know, I could very well agree with the overall objectives. If we're trying to amend the War Powers Act in 1973, given the massive increase in combat capability that's happened since then, that's maybe something I could support. But maybe it's maybe I would necessarily support an authorization from use of military force that is so open-ended as the one we had after 9-11. Perhaps that was a mistake. But to, this, this whole effort is, I think, just kind of a little too dishonest for me to really I get behind it, even though I may agree with some of the objectives of the of the folks who are working really hard. And for that reason, I I, I really ask. I'll vote for it, and I ask everybody else to consider voting. I'll, I'll vote against. It. I ask everybody else to vote against it as well. So that being said, any further comment? Call for question. Okay, call for the question. Senator Brennan. No. Senator Furphy. No. Senator Kolb. No. Senator Pappas? No. Chairman Boner? No. Five no's.